Welcome back to the Health IQ Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dustin Portella. Super excited to be joined by a cosmetic chemist today named Ron Robinson. You may have heard of him because he has a big social media following. But if you haven't heard of Ron, you've definitely heard of some of the brands that he has worked on in the skincare space, including many of the brands under Estee Lauder and L'Oreal, before he went on to found his own company called Beauty Stat. He's also been a consultant and chemist on the road skincare with Haley Bieber. So he, his work is prolific, and you've no doubt seen and probably used some of the products that Ron has had a personal hand in. Ron has a very interesting story in his pathway to becoming a cosmetic chemist. And if you're into skincare, you definitely need to understand what it is that a cosmetic chemist does and why their expertise is so important. So thank you for joining us on the podcast, Ron. It's great to see you again. Likewise, Dr. Portella. Great to be here. Thank you. So you and I have been in touch through social media for essentially dating back to the days of COVID. And I think it was Clubhouse where we first met on some of those rooms when we were all shut up in our houses (laughs) and just trying to reach out and get some human connection. (laughs) So we had some mutual friends, I think through Mimi Banks, and we got in touch then. And then finally, only a month ago, had the chance to meet in person. And we went over to the gym at Chelsea Piers in New York and got a good workout in, got a good pump in. And we shared some of that on social media. A lot of similar interest there with just taking good care of our own bodies and good care of our skin. Yes, indeed. Yes. That gave me the chance to learn a little bit about your story. And as a dermatologist recommending skincare products, I understand what a cosmetic chemist does. I love chemistry myself. If I could do it over again, I would have majored in chemistry rather than zoology. But I want to hear a little bit about your story and how you ended up as a cosmetic chemist, because that was not your intention when you started down your educational pathway. It wasn't. I'm the accidental cosmetic chemist. So I grew up in a family of professionals. My mom was a nurse, PhD in nursing, and her mother was a nurse. And she moved here from Barbados back in the 50s, wanting all of her kids to become either a doctor or a lawyer. That Mm -hmm. was the thing that you had to do. You had to become a professional. And me and my brothers tended to do better in science in school. So I got pushed into, Ron, be pre-med, go to med school, get a great career. And I didn't know what else I wanted to do. So I followed my mother's advice, went to med school, did not like it at all, realized that after a year, I dropped out moved back in with my parents and was just sending out resumes. And by the way, Dr. Patella, back then there was no internet. I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit older. So at resumes, you literally had to print out your resume, type it, print it out, and then fold it, put it in an envelope and mail it through the classified section of the newspaper to a post office box where the companies would open it. And then if you got a call, to your to your landline. That's how you found out you had an, yeah. <laughs> an interview or not. <laughs> there was no so, Indeed or no, anything no, like that. There was nothing like that. Clinic, the clinic division of the SA Lauder companies called me in for an interview. I had no idea there was a whole world of science behind cosmetics mm-hmm. and skincare. So they called me into the, this interview. I drive up. It's the clinic labs for the SA Lauder companies, big white building out in, on Long Island, New York. And they hired me on the spot. They love my science background. And that's how I totally fell into this world of beauty. So I worked for Clinique and the Estee Lauder companies for about a decade. And I fell in love with it. And just going back to my mom for a second, remember I told you that she was really disappointed that I dropped out of med school. After a year at Clinique, I came home with a bunch of samples of products I was working on. And she loved them. She totally fell into beauty and skincare. And at that moment, I was forgiven for dropping out of med school. (laughs) She was like, get me more skincare products. That's all I want from you. I'm glad you were able to redeem yourself. Yeah. So you went to a year of medical school and I can understand why you would hate it after a year. It is a really challenging thing. And I think medical education, although it's still very good, they've made it more hospitable. And I imagine that when you were going through it, they did not make any attempt to give you comfort in medical school. <laughs> no, it was really a sense of really trying to weed people out yeah. and just make it, it was really tough. You really, and a lot of people, a lot of my classmates, they really wanted to be a doctor. So it was well worth it for them to go in and I, I didn't really enjoy it. And yeah. So here I am. What was your undergraduate degree in bachelor's, master's? What gave you that background that Clinique saw on your resume and said, we want to interview this guy? Great question. Biology and chemistry major. 
Okay. Double major then. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it probably was appealing for them to see somebody that had been in medical school and gave you just a, a more advanced science perspective. Yes, absolutely. Because for those not familiar, the first year of medical school is at least traditionally been completely the sciences repeated. It does start to introduce a little bit more of the why you use this in medicine, but you're again, mm -hmm. taking biochemistry basics. You're doing physiology and anatomy. And it's traditionally not been until the second year that you start to go through body systems and understand human physiology for medicine. And it was like getting a master's degree in science, probably by doing that year of medical school. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, it, it since has helped me obviously as a cosmetic chemist, but yes, it was grueling. And however, I'm so glad I found my new love being a cosmetic chemist. Yeah, absolutely. So you had that time at, at Clinique Labs. Now, I'm sure you had a good mentor there, not really being familiar with cosmetic chemistry at all, although understanding chemistry, organic chemistry, and things like that. Who was your mentor at the time that helped you to really understand the ins and outs of that universe? Yeah, it's, I think that my hiring manager, who was a lab manager, was really the one that really coached me along. As you said, I had this degree in biology and chemistry. How does that translate to working with ingredients? Mm -hmm. And what it really is like being a chemist, it's part chef if you will, because I'm blending things together to try to create this recipe that looks, feels, and has great aesthetics. And then it's also the chemistry piece of knowing what's going to work together and what's going to actually have some sort of function or feel on skin. So mm -hmm. it's the blend of both worlds, which I something that I really gravitated to and really love doing. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Take me to the next steps after you left Clinique, the Clinique Labs. Where was the next stop for you? Yes. Yeah, so in the world of beauty, there is the role of R&D where you have the chemists that work on the bench and then you have marketing. I moved my career to what's called product development, which is a role that's in the middle. Mm -hmm. It works with R&D and works with the chemists and really shows them what we want to the product to look and feel like from an aesthetic perspective, as well as what benefits it's going to provide and work with marketing on giving marketing a product that's, hey, this is going to be a great product that you could then market. You yeah. could then bring to the consumer and package it and merchandise it and all of those things. So I moved from that role. And R&D worked for me in this new liaison role called product development. So okay. I took on that role when I worked for Revlon, Avon, and L'Oreal. Okay, very good. Lancome was one of the brands you worked on for L'Oreal, very yes. popular skincare line, considered premium. It's a high price point. Yeah. Did you notice a cultural difference working for Estee Lauder versus L'Oreal? What is it like working for those giant corporations? Yeah. And brother, back then, this is again, pre-social media. So literally powerful brands like those can really have an influence on what consumers actually get and there's there is no like room for a place for a consumer to talk amongst each other mm -hmm. in a big way to find out hey does this really work you really relied on going to your beauty advisor at the store and learning about the product maybe trying the product there and you didn't have that connection with others so, so there was no tiktok or yeah. anything like that where you can go and see what's trending so the brand those big brands by the way when i was working at clinique they were the number one brand worldwide, powerful brand. There were no indie brands. You couldn't be an indie brand because right. the big guys, they ruled. They had the store presence. There's no internet, so you can't find out about other things. So they're the ones that had the big share of voice. So what it's like there is that you have a lot of control. You, you could really develop anything you want, and it would likely sell. It would likely be a success because you had this customer that didn't have access to a lot of information as well as other indie brands at that time. So it was good in the fact that there was a lot of money being made and sure. a lot of success and growth at the time. And my role was able, I was able to grow and have a lot of control in terms of what came to market without a lot of feedback from others like there is now. So now obviously we have tons of indie brands. We have Anybody can upload a video that could go viral and say, this is the most amazing product of 2023. And so as a chemist and you're formulating now, how do you see the industry versus those days where you were very independent? You didn't have to worry about outside feedback. 
Has that made your job more challenging knowing that a billion people could scrutinize your work and post mm -hmm. it online? Or has it made it more exciting for you or maybe a bit of both? It's exactly both. I think what's exciting is that the access or the way to get into beauty is a lot easier. As you said, post a video, goes viral. That's an opportunity. The challenge is that there's so many brands out there now, more than ever. So how do you cut through the clutter? And I think as a chemist today, we, are, we have to be close to the customer. Yeah. The customer is right. You have to really focus on them. You can't say, you can't just present anything to them and say, this is it. This is all you need. They have a lot of options. They're more educated than ever. They're savvier than ever. And you have to really show, you have to be transparent, build trust, and show the receipts. Show yeah. them that you've done, your, you've done your homework, you've done your testing, and you've got a product that they should want to try and use. That's really fascinating, sharing your perspective on the consumer. Do you think that the increase in consumer scrutiny has led to significantly better products on the market today versus 20, 30 years ago? Absolutely. In my time, we've seen ingredients really be removed from products. Some very much warranted. Mm -hmm. Some, yes, there's a lot of, there were a lot of good data saying, okay, it's okay to remove these. Others questionable because there might have been faulty studies which have scared consumers and forced the brands have been forced to remove them just to prevent any type of noise going on. So yeah. I think we're in, a, we're in a much better place. So I do think this consumer savviness and consumer really trying to understand what's in their product, where is it sourced, and that sort of thing has really made the industry better. I share your sentiment. I think products have gotten better. They're very cosmetically elegant, and I think they're doing more good for our skin. But we certainly know that there's incidents of consumers just saying this product is bad. We have organizations like the EWG that may form an opinion based on one study in yeah. not even a human model. And right. we have to be very careful about taking that and translating it into this is now what you should or shouldn't use on your skin. And sometimes that is to the detriment of the consumer. And I think people don't understand that because most people are not very scientifically literate. Definitely. And it's that case of almost, they need to consider context, concentration, way it's being used. And right. I think if you can't say if everything at a too high a level can be dangerous and harmful. So yeah. we have to understand levels matter, context matters, how you use it matters. And it's the education piece that I think the brands then have to step up and do to make sure they don't, they squash any type of fear mongering that might happen based on a study that's not relevant. And I think that's one of the benefits of social media also is that great brands can partner with dermatologists and cosmetic chemists such as yourself to get the right messaging out there. Yeah. And I think people don't understand that a chemist or a dermatologist, we don't want people using bad products and we don't want people using products that are harmful for them. And we really have no incentive to get online and say, use this product. And secretly we're in a back room saying, we know that this is going to disrupt your hormones or cause problems with your kidneys or something like that. Exactly. If there's something better that comes along, I'm all for it. I was just doing a huge literature search on antioxidants because I'm preparing a video response to somebody who was saying sunscreen is toxic, it causes cancer, all of this stuff. And they shared a paper that went through all of these different antioxidants. And mm. as I looked at all of them, almost none of these were being done as a comparison to sunscreen. Almost none of them were being done on people, they were either cultured human keratinocytes in a Petri dish, cultured melanocytes, or in a mice model. But there was one that was talking about sulforaphane, which is an antioxidant that comes largely from broccoli. And they right. put this on people's skin, and it showed a reduction in erythema after exposure to ultraviolet light. And so if somebody found a way to make broccoli the best sunblock <laughs> in the world, I would promote it. But currently, Absolutely. we're not there. It's just not there. So Absolutely. we're not trying to get people to use sunscreen for the sake of boosting the sunscreen industry or any other ingredient. If there's something better, we're all for it. And I hope people understand that when we take to social media with these messages. Totally agree. Yeah, it's, it behooves all of us to do good. 
as a brand, you want to sell a product. You want people to come back. You're not trying to hurt anyone and then have them not come back and have noise created. So that's what I think consumers need to understand and consider. I want to ask you about a recent podcast that was out on a popular channel and people have sent this to me. I've listened to it and I'm curious if you've listened to this science versus episode about skincare. I have not. Tell me more about this. So this is a popular podcast called Science Versus, and each week they take a new topic and they dive into the data on is this real or not. Mm -hmm. And so there's Science Versus Skincare is their most recent one. And let me pull up some of their other episodes to give you an idea if I can spell it right. So here's some of their recent episode. Science Versus Gluten, Should You Give It Up? Science Versus AI. Science versus the dentist, should you even floss your teeth? And then back in May, it was science versus skincare. And they went through and they, that they were able to get independent agencies to basically give a stamp of approval to a product based on, basically they would tell this independent agency, we are trying to create a product where people will say it reduced their fine lines and boosted their skin radiance. And they essentially sent them a bland moisturizer with no active ingredient in it. And these people, they farmed it out to 18 people. They had them do a survey before and after, and then they sent back. And now they have independent testing to verify, boosted my skin's radiance and reduced wrinkles. But they showed that there's a lot of products over the counter that really don't do anything when it's tested by a more rigorous method. And so this is something that I was curious to see if you had heard about and if you had an opinion on it. I have not. It sounds like they're looking at the placebo effect, right? Yeah, like yeah. There, 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 there's that, that if you tell someone that they may get some benefit, even something that's inactive, they'll see a benefit because right. Of that. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's. I think it's very. I think it's very interesting. I think there's there might be some degree of that, but I think you talked about a rigorous testing. A lot of brands are moving towards being more independent doing more independent clinical testing, having third party involved where they can't tamper with results. It's a controlled environment and consumers are looking for brands that can show that type of testing. And I think that's a trend that will continue. That would be a great episode. I would love to see you respond to that episode on social media as a cosmetic (laughs) chemist, because I I am planning a response as well from a dermatology perspective. I'll work on that because on my social, I've been doing more answering questions for really covering beauty topics that, that consumers have and beauty editors have been asking me about. I've been taking going to video and putting that out there yeah. to help educate. Very good. So let's jump back into your story. You've now worked for some of the biggest players in the cosmetic industry and you're tired of being an employee or you have bigger dreams. You want to bring something to life. I know you started a blog called Beauty Stat quite a long time ago. Was your intention even back then that you were going to bring forth your own brand? Or tell me about the evolution of Beauty Stat as a brand. Yeah, I started Beauty Stat as because I thought there were too many brands. And this is going back a long time before online you know, and indie brands even occurred. I thought there were too many brands in on the shelf, whether it's department store or drugstore. And I started Beauty Stat as a resource for consumers to learn more from an expert like me and my team that could re- review products and really give consumers the ability to cut through the clutter with hey, an expert that's actually giving them advice based on what's in the formula, what my review of it and my team's review of it. And my goal was to not clutter the market anymore with another brand. And it wasn't until the fact that I started this blog and I started to hear a lot of feedback around vitamin C specifically. I'm recognizing that it's a great ingredient for my skin, but a lot of formulas out there are oxidizing. And just so everyone knows, vitamin C, it's a powerful antioxidant. It's, a, it's an essential vitamin. We need to ingest it or apply it topically. And when we put it in a topical skincare, in pure form, it's very, it has, it's very, has a very short shelf life and it oxidizes very quickly. And what happens is that it turns brown, turns orange, And it's very, it's not appealing at all. So I thought there was an opportunity if I could stabilize pure vitamin C, which is is an ingredient that a lot of consumers know is good for them, then that could make for a breakthrough in the industry. So me and my chemist team, we spent a few years trying to stabilize that ingredient and put it into a very aesthetic base and formula. 
and we did clinical independent clinical testing. The results came out amazing. And we got our patents issued on the ability to stabilize pure vitamin C through our encapsulation process. Mm -hmm. So that's what made me pivot Beauty Stat, the blog, into this brand with a star vitamin C product. And we, met, we went to market with that product four years ago, mm -hmm. and it's become a bestseller. We're, we're now sold in Ulta Beauty nationwide, and it's one of our bestsellers. And we're super, I'm super proud of the team and what we've been able to do in such a short amount of time. Yeah, it really became a popular product very quickly. And I've used many vitamin C products. And when I first used yours back during probably 2020 and COVID, I could tell it was a different product. I could feel it on my skin. I was like, this is this is actually like real vitamin C. I can feel it like tingle on my skin. And yep. whereas there's other brands that are considered the gold standard where I really felt the first time I used it, after a couple of weeks, it's a great product. It's really helping my skin, but it did quickly change color in the bottle. Every time you open it up, and I believe yours comes in an airless pump so that we're yeah. not exposing it to air. But every time you, I would open that dropper, it would get exposed to air. And yeah. over time it did turn color. And then of course I'm left wondering, is this expensive product even doing any more good for my skin? But it can, it convinced me to be a vitamin C proponent. But then I was like, I don't know if this is the best product for the price point. Yeah. Our brand, we saw that need we saw those products out there. And by the way, vitamin C comes in pure form. It also comes in derivative form. The pure form is the most active one, and that's where a lot of the data on its ability to, to treat the skin comes from. The fact is that short shelf life, that oxidation rate, really diminishes the benefits you get in a short amount of time. So yeah. we have a three-year shelf life on our product. Yeah, that's fantastic. Tell me a little bit about these vitamin C derivatives. I know that there's brands that put three or four different types of vitamin C in a product. Do you think that there's a value to that? Or is this a way to still deliver vitamin C, even though they know the pure vitamin C will degrade? What, what should a consumer think about these variations of vitamin C? The variations, we'll put it this way, in terms of really showing the, what's going to really impact the skin in a significant way, the data is there that shows you want to be in that 10 to 20% of pure vitamin C, at least when it gets to the skin. Mm -hmm. What the derivatives do is they take vitamin C and, and combine it with a salt. And then that's what helps keeps it, keep it, keeps it stable. And then what it gets applied to the skin, then the vitamin C is the pure form then gets to form. But mm -hmm. the net impact of that pure vitamin C is diminished because it's been combined with yeah. this other salt ingredient. So brands have been pulling from here and there and what happens is that we don't know exactly if we're going to get to that 10 to 20% pure vitamin C really getting to work on the skin. So that's the concern that I have with them. And I think, as you mentioned, some vitamin C serums can tingle. Some people even complain of, of irritation from them. Mm -hmm. Everyone's skin is different or reacts differently to it. So I think the derivatives have a place for those with sensitive skin and want right. some level of vitamin C. Yeah. And that's a, that could be appealing to them. But those that could tolerate vitamin C, if you could use the pure form that's stable, you're going to get, you're going to enjoy the most benefits. From and that that's where we have the bulk of the data to support vitamin C. Correct. And so we can almost think of these derivatives as the conversion that an over-the-counter retinol has to go through in order yes. to become yep. retinoic acid in the skin. We yep. start with a certain concentration and we end up with a certain concentration depending on variables with the patient's skin, their enzymatic activity, and then we see what the final benefit will be. Yep, great analogy, yes. Very good. So you started Beauty Stat. This was your baby. You put your heart and soul into a product. And then you're also well known for partnering on the Road Skincare line with Haley Bieber, which has been massively successful. How did that opportunity come up and what was it like working with Haley Bieber and her team? Yeah, it's so funny. I just saw Haley yesterday. She's celebrating one, a one-year anniversary of her brand, Road. So I'm super excited to be part of that. She's been working on this for a long time. She's love, she loves skincare and, want, and really wanted to learn as much as she could about it, but also wanted to bring in a team of experts that were going to help her in terms of the formulation and conceptualization of the products. She reached out to me during during COVID. She DM'd me on Instagram. I was like, oh, Haley Bieber's following me. And she's messaging <laughs> me. <laughs> and 
we chatted, we, zo we zoomed, this is during COVID, so we're all on lockdown, we're wearing our hoodies, and she's conceiving this product line, mm -hmm. and we gel. I love her passion. She is involved. She is determined. She is, she's decisive, and she knows, hey, I need, I, I need help. I want to understand how this works. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing about this ingredient, Juan. Tell me more about that. What's the buzz on it? Does it really work? And we worked on putting this brand together, and I'm thrilled that I've been a part of that brand as well. Yeah, it's been very successful, as has yours in Beauty Stat. And I think that consumers need to understand that in today's world, marketing is important, but good products don't sell well or sorry, bad products don't sell well just because of marketing. Right. You really have to have good products. You have to develop them and they have to deliver results or people will drag them on social media. And so I think that the success of these brands speaks really to your expertise as a chemist. And so congratulations for that and your Thank massive you so success. Much. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a couple more questions and this may be like asking you a, a parent, their favorite child, but do you have a favorite formula that you have developed and brought to market? Yeah. The original vitamin C or universal C skin refiner. That's, that's my baby, this guy. Yeah. So that's the one is the one that's my favorite. They're all my favorites though. It's yeah. the, I guess there's something about the firstborn that's special, but all, they're all special and yeah. I, I love them all. And they're part of my routine. I think that's key. Obviously, I'm the initial tester as well. So I'm the initial guinea pig. And I really evolve them and tweak them until I get them just right. And they're all my faves. Yeah, that's that was the answer that I thought you'd come up with. That is the hero product, of course, of Beauty Stat. Now, just following you on social media, and I'd encourage everybody to do that. We'll share the links to your social down in the video description here for YouTube and the podcast show notes. But anybody who follows you know that you also really try to live a very healthy and active lifestyle. And that is something that I'd like to ask you about and why you feel that's important and how you think being active, physically active, helps to improve somebody's skin. Yeah, I think it's hugely important. I'm a little older and I think in order for me to maintain my energy level to be this entrepreneur, business owner, being in physical and mental shape is really key for me. So it's mm -hmm. really been part of my life to exercise. I walk a lot. I weight train a lot. I do cardio. A lot. I really do a lot physically because it helps me think more clearly. It helps me manage my energy all day long on an even level. But I think also it, gi it gives me the physical ability to run around when I need to. And I can do that and keep up in, the, in this busy, crazy market. If I need to be in store, I know you go into store a lot as well. If I had to be in right. Ulta Beauty and I need to meet with the sales teams there and the associates there, I could be there all day on my feet and walking around and showing product and demoing, et cetera, and then run to the next location and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that really helps me be able to do my job better. So it's really key for me. And it's just really given, it gives me my center and my focus. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And I feel the same way. If I don't get my physical activity in, if I don't go to the gym, I know that it impacts the way that I am at home with my family, at work, with my patients. And then when I have to go on the road, it's important for me to maintain that routine. Yeah, absolutely. As we wrap up, I want to ask your tips to a consumer on reading labels on their cosmetic products. When somebody's walking through the store and they're overwhelmed by the marketing and the things that they've seen on social media and they turn that label around, what kind of tips would you have for somebody as they're looking at that label of ingredients and how to understand what those actually will mean to them? Yeah, a couple of things I ask consumers to do. First of all, there are, a lot, there are a lot of people that get tied into, oh, this is the next trending thing on TikTok. And they need to think about, first of all, is this something that I have a concern about that I want to address? Mm -hmm. Because what's trending on TikTok, having a, a, whatever the term is, a glass skin, let's say. If your skin's very oily, you're, you don't want to, you may not want to have glass skin. So shopping right. for products for glass skin may not be a fit. You may be looking for something for more mattifying or keeping your skin more balanced. So that's one thing. Don't chase trends. Look for products that are really going to treat your concern. The next thing is to look for what type of testing a product is doing. Do they have any consumer testing or independent clinical testing that show, validate, that it is shown to do. You're looking to, it's looking to address what you're looking 
to what your concern is. And then in terms of ingredient listing, certain ingredients are trending. And basically, the ingredient listing is really from the highest percentage to the lowest. And, it, and basically, anything below 1% can be mixed up wherever the manufacturer wants to put them. So mm -hmm. looking at those first few ingredients, those are pretty much what's the, mostly in that formula. In most cases, it's water. And because a lot water serves as the carrier, the mm -hmm. vehicle for the ingredients in the formula. But the other ingredients that are just below that, they're going to be at higher concentrations. So that's one thing you can look for. But some active ingredients, they don't need to be at the top of the label to be active. So that's another thing a consumer needs to understand as well. Retinol, for example, you could have a really great retinol product that's under 1%. So it mm -hmm. may not be at the top of the ingredient list. It may be lower down. But the brand may tell you, this is how much retinol we have in this product. Yeah. And it's shown to deliver results for you. So I, want, I don't want consumers to look completely at the ingredient label and judge based on that. They can look at other things as well, like claims and testing that the brand can do to show they've done their homework. Yeah, that's really great advice. Forward to the rest of 2023, 2024, do you have any predictions of trends or ingredients to look out for in the skincare market? We're renowned for vitamin C. We have something really special in a new ingredient, not a new ingredient for us. Yeah. that we have not tapped into. And we have a solution for this ingredient. So with every ingredient, there's a plus and a minus, there's a concern, and we've been able to solve it. So we can't wait to tell you, share more on that new product when we're ready for launch. Well, I'm definitely excited to see what that might be. Ron, I know that people are going to love this discussion, and I hope that everybody will go and follow you on social media. Where's the best place for people to find you on social media? Follow my brand, Beautystat, at Beautystat on all social media. And follow me on Instagram at Ron Robinson Cosmetic Chemist. We'll make sure that those are on the notes for the video and the audio. I want to thank you for your time. I know you are crazy busy and I appreciate the time that you've made here. And when I came to New York that we got a lift in. So keep doing what you're doing. And I'm really excited to see everything that Beauty Stat will bring to market over the next few years. Likewise, Dr. Rotella, thank you so much for having me. And let me know when you're in New York City again so we could lift and pump some iron again. Absolutely. We'll do it. All right. Have a great weekend, Ron. You too. Bye. Bye.